Today is uh, the second part of Take Your Mat, M-A-T, not Matt, M-A-T-T, or not Matthew, right, Matthew, right? We talked about it the other day, where it's just Take Your Mat. It started out with this, the obvious question, it was given by Jesus Christ, but not always the obvious answer, a very obvious or honest answer is given. Real quickly, and it's not up there, but I'll fill it in, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, it's an account of the Pool of Bethesda. There in Jerusalem, there's this Pool of Bethesda where the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed go, and they wait for the angel to come and stir the waters, and the first ones in the water are the ones that receive a healing. And people would come there day after day after day after day wanting to get in that pool to receive a healing. In John chapter 5, verse number 6, when Jesus saw him, a man, lying there, and learned that he had been in, and hear this, this condition for a long time, he asked him. And here's the obvious question that doesn't always get an honest answer. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? The same question, I believe with all of my heart, is asked of us each and every single day of our lives. Do you, do I want to get well? You ever pray for somebody to hit the bottom of the barrel? To hit rock bottom? You ever pray that? Have you ever hit rock bottom? I've prayed for people to hit rock bottom, then I pray for God to dig a deeper hole because it's not working. Anybody know people like that? Lord, let them hit the rock bottom and let them go down about another couple levels because they need to, they need to really hit some rocks. We pray that whatever it takes in our lives or the lives of others, for us to come to the honest question, yes, I want to be healed, whatever it takes. It's important that we honestly answer that question. Do you want to get well? See, here's the thing. This man's condition, we don't know if he is lame, uh, paralyzed, or blind, or all three. But what is your condition? See, all of us, you have to understand, have a condition. We were born with a condition. We were born into sin. People say to me all the time, Pastor, why do children die? Why do children come down with cancer? Why did this accident happen? Why did this happen? Why do the people that are so evil, why do they make out so well? And the people that are doing things for God, they're struggling. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? And they blame God for it being so unfair. And I kindly explain, as I've explained it to myself over the years of seeing things happen, and sometimes I scratch my head, sometimes, yes, I admit it, I get angry at the result of what I've just seen. But yet, I'm, my heart is still focused on one thing. It's not his fault. God created us to be in a perfect image of him. But yet, man chose sin over, over Christ, God. We chose our, our sin over our salvation. We chose the now for the eternity. We chose that. Man, we are born with a condition of sin. We ignore it. We, we mask it over. People go to church just to cover it over, to kind of keep it squelched down so they never have to face the sin. We self-medicate with relationships or drugs or alcohol or whatever it may be so that we don't see the sin in our lives, but we're sinful. We have a condition. And Jesus Christ asks us the same question to each and every one because the Bible says God would not, would not want a single man to perish. So the question is going to be given to every single human being. Do you want to get well? And the only way you're going to get well is through Jesus Christ. So we have a condition. Let's get it right there. We have a a condition and only Jesus Christ can heal us of this condition remember when Jesus asked this was the scripture I shared last week in Revelation chapter 3 verse number 20 he says this behold I stand at the door knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door 
I will come in, I will eat with them, and they will eat with me. See, this shows that the invitation has been given from the Savior to the sinner. Folks, when you get to the place where you realize and you come to grips with the fact that you're a sinner, there is not a single thing that you can do or I can do to make us get rid of the sin in our life other than allowing the gift and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to come into our life. If that, it, when you get to the place that's the only thing that's going to change you, then your life will begin to change. But if you're constantly trying to fix it on your own and do it on your own and figure out a way around it, and I'm not so bad, and we're really good at being not so bad. We can always find someone badder, badder, badder than us, badder, worser, worser, worser than us. We can always find someone worser than us. In fact, the, the person that's worser than us is probably sitting right next to us right now. And you're sitting there going, I hope to God they're listening because they need it. We can always do that. It's like, you know, it, it, we, we can, but we got to get to the place where we go, you know what? I'm a sinner. I got a condition. I got a condition. I'm a sinner. See, Jesus gave an invitation to everyone. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, you listening? You listening? It was so cool, the end of that song, I just felt impressed for us to just listen. God speaks in the stillness of his voice. In the stillness he speaks. And are we listening though? Do we want to listen? Do I want to listen to her all the time? Yes. Yes, I want to listen to her all the time. Does she want to listen to me? Never. Never. Seriously, we choose what we listen to and we choose what we don't listen to, right? We do. We can choose to listen to God or we can choose not to listen to God. And then we can be the one going, I didn't hear him. I didn't hear him. But we have a condition. It says, behold, I stand at the door. If anyone hears my voice and then opens the door, so you got to, oh, wait, somebody's knocking. I'm going to go open the door. Or sit on the couch and go, oh, I'm not going to go open that door. He says, I will come in. He doesn't say, I'm just going to stand on the porch. I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand on the porch. I'm not going to stand in your front yard. I'm going to come in. And then we're going to sit down and eat. I'm going to eat with you and you're going to eat with me. What's, we, we miss that in our, what are we, are we like a Western, we're a Western civilization. The Eastern culture is so different than ours. I don't eat because I like to eat. I eat because I have to. You know, give me food, wolf it down, inhale it. Let's move on to something else. Am I correct? Can I get an amen from you? Amen. All right. She's like, all the time, we'll be out eating. She'll, she'll crack me. Lydia, when we were at your house a couple weeks ago, I got cracked by her because I was, she goes, are you hungry? Obvious question. Yes. Steve, slow down, okay? So, so for me, it's like, oh, look at that food. Isn't that going to be great? No. If I, I'm just going to chew it, swallow it, move on. Because it's, it, but other people, that a lot of us are like that. How many of you work construction? You know what I'm talking about. Or whatever. You're in, you're out. You don't sit there and you don't talk about feelings. You don't do, uh, you're there, you're going to eat, you're going to move on. Not in the Eastern culture. Everything revolves around the meal. So when he says, I'll come in and eat with you and you will eat with me, that's a big deal, man. That's like you're going to go in, you're going to spend time with each other. You're going to talk with each other. You're going to spend this, you're going to break bread and make a relationship with it. He says, I'm just not going to show up and wolf down the food. And out the door I go, he says, I'm going to stay there with you. You have to get that kind of concept in your head when he talks about Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will, and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with them and them with me. There's a relationship there. People, religion will get you nowhere. Relationship will get you to eternity. Now, he says also this. In John chapter 5, 8, and this is where we pick up. I left off last week with this. When he looked at this man who we find out has been in this condition for 38 years. Now, Again, we don't know if he's 38 years old or if he's like 60 or like 75 like Mike. We don't know that. But, uh, but what we do know is there's a period of time that's been designated 
38 years. So, this 30, let's, let's just say he's 38 years old. Jesus walks up to this 38-year-old man who's paralyzed, lame, or blind, or all three are a combination of three or a combination of two, which could be a lot of different combinations. And he walks over to him and he says, after he asks him, do you want to get well? And then the guy gives him excuses. He says this, get up. And like I said last week, when he used that word, that term, get up, that wasn't a term of, you know, like, mommy goes shakes little Johnny to wake up for school. Oh, Johnny. Oh, Johnny. It's, it's time for you to get up. My mom would have never. My mom, my mom, no. My mom didn't have that tone. That, she didn't have that volume in her voice. Which, Oh, Stevie, get up. It's time. If I wasn't up, she'd flip my mattress over. All right, a bucket of cold water, an air horn, whatever it would take. Because you got to get up. There is an arousal, there is a, an urgency when Jesus Christ says, get up. Get the lead out of your rear end and get up. That's the translation. That's what it says. And then he says, pick up your mat and walk. Verse number nine. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. So that should be the end of the sermon. Yins would really like that, wouldn't you? But there's three commands issued by Christ. Not suggestions, but commands. Number one, get up. A call to action. You want to get well? Get up. Get out of your pity pot party. Get out of your, your, your stuff. Get out of your sin. Get out of your life. Get out of your cesspool that you sit in. Get out of all the filth and garbage that you sit in. Get out. Get up. It is a call to action. It isn't a suggestion. It's not, hey, would you just come on over? It's get up. It's a command that an officer would give a soldier. It's not to be questioned. It's not to be hesitated by. It is to be acted upon instantly. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. There it is. You listen, you hear, you open. It's called action. Salvation, by the way, is a called action. Salvation, you're not going to get from osmosis. Kids, look at me. You're not going to become a Christian because your parents are. Even if you like sleep next to your parents and hope like you, you, you could suck it in. What you're sucking out of your parents is their brains. It starts in pregnancy. Those babies, first of all, you females, you, they suck your brains out. And then once you're born, they, you suck them out of both parents. That's why they walk around going, uh. You know parents who have kids because they're like walking around like. Oh, they're, they're parents. It's not going to be that way. It's not a thing. If you, uh, one guy says he used to sleep with his Bible under his pillow so that he, he was sleeping on the Word of God. He was a heathen. His mouth was filthy. He was a, I sleep on the Bible. Why? Why, you think it's just going to like, you know, become... No. You take part in it. Salvation is an action. Lord, here I am, I receive you. That's a call to action. So right here he says this, he says, get up. Now, if the man doesn't get up, he will continue to lie there until he dies. So, if we do not heed the calling of God, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens, here's my voice, opens the door, I will come in. If we don't heed to his knock, if we don't heed to his call, if we don't heed to his command, we will lie where we are and until we die. We just had this the great uh, four, four weeks of Mark uh, teaching on the end time stuff. It was really cool. By the way, Mark's back from the Amazon. Those of you that went to it, didn't end up the way he thought. There, and I'll, I'll have to have him tell you, but it was a, it, we, he was texting me. There was violence, broke out in the country. Um, they, they couldn't get past a certain point. 
Uh, they were threatened to be killed. They, get, they come back they, real quick. They stop at an orphanage on the way back to get a cup of coffee and, and, and to use the bathroom in the orphanage. 70 kids come running out and Mark and, and, and Pastor Thomas and, the, and their uh, driver interpreter was there. The people had just, the kids had just been praying. There was no money for food and never supplies. Mark and them gave them $1,400 that they had with them, and which will feed the entire 72 or 74 orphans and staff for an entire month and minister all their needs. But it was so cool. But, but the fact is that it was just one constant battle after another. The driver that picked them up to try to take them to a certain point that was turned back, they saw the driver the next day. He had been beaten severely by people, by rebels, and they had been beaten because he took these Mark and them to this place. It totally spun whatever they were going to do, but God had a great purpose for them being there. But Mark taught about at the last days about people, about the rapture and then about the seven years of tribulation and how all these things are going on. And I'm sitting there going, this is so true. And I've heard this my entire 40 some years of being a Christian. If people don't accept Jesus Christ before the rapture of the church, it's going to be a whole lot harder during the tribulation, especially if you heard. There's going to be a lot of people that have sat their butts in churches. Just their butts, not their souls. Their rear ends have been in there, but not their hearts. And they're going to hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it until the day of Jesus' return. And after that happens, they're going to know what happened. Because they've heard it enough, didn't mean they acted upon it, but they've heard it enough. And then there's going to come the Antichrist and everything that goes on in the three, three and a half years of pretty decent and three and a half years of just brutality. There's going to be martyrs, the 144,000 Jews that are going to become the missionaries, which is going to be totally awesome. It's going to become the missionaries in the last days. They're going to be martyred left and right because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But they will go to martyr, martyrdom willingly because of the cross of Jesus Christ. But the fact is, if you don't accept now, if you don't serve now, you ain't going to serve then. You'll be like, oh, you know, I will. That'll be a good wake-up call for me. No, you won't. You'll, you'll explain it away. You'll rationalize it away. You'll just put it to the side. You'll always be something that you can overtake. Because why? Because there will be a great deception that is poured out in the last days over many people. There will be like a bucket poured out from, 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 from hell itself to deceive people. So if he doesn't get up, he's dead where he lies. The cross, hear me, the cross is a call to action. You can't look at the cross and, and not without realizing what it is for. It is there because of you and I. The cross of Jesus Christ only exists because of our sin. The cross of Jesus Christ, when you see that cross, that is a call to action. Will you remain on the mat where you laid in your sin? Will Jesus cry out from the cross, do you want to get well? And what will be your response? Will your response be, well, maybe tomorrow? Will your response be, well, it's not so bad laying here on this mat? What will your response be? The only reason that cross is there is because of our sin. It is a call to action. The cross calls us to leave behind a life of sin and to pursue a life of, uh, in Jesus Christ. It calls us to that. It's just not a piece of jewelry you wear around your neck. It's just not something you stick in, in, your, in your car so that he protects you while you're driving like an idiot. It's more than just a symbol. It's a reality. It is God's sacrifice, God's call to man. Do you want to get well? I have the answer. Now, the second thing he tells him to do is to pick up your mat. Pick up your mat. Get up! Now pick up your mat. Well, this is the part of the entire message that I've just really been wrestling with. Why? Why? Why, Why pick up your mat? Okay. Why pick up the mat? And what exactly is the mat? First of all, the mat was where this man's existence had lived for 38 years. That's his life, that mat. It could be just a flat piece of like burlap cloth. It could be a different type of material. It could be 
Uh, some describe it as a bed, but it's not like it's a sleep number bed that you're carrying this thing around. It, it just, it could be, I, they didn't have foam rubber back then. It could have been a little bit of a, a cloth with some straw stuffed in it and sewn together. We're not really told what exactly it is, but it basically is this. It's a beggar's mat. Now, he laid on this thing for 38 years. Now, okay, we don't know if it's the same one, okay? Like some of you would be like, that's pretty disgusting. I, I would have gotten a new one, okay? But he laid on a mat. Let's work with that. For 38 years, he laid on a mat. He was defined by that mat. That was his definition of who he was. And let me explain. For example, to have a mat out in public showed others that you were a beggar or you were someone who was disabled. If someone went walking down the street carrying a mat, you automatically went beggar, disabled, castaway. If you see somebody down in the city pushing a shopping cart with a blue tarp over it automatically, homeless, cast away, mentally ill, right away. We, it's defined. It's defined. I mean, we define people by other things, but the fact of the matter is, this Matt during that time defined who he was. This is who he was. He was a beggar. He was someone who was disabled. So why did Jesus look at this brand new guy who couldn't get up on his own and he just said to him to get up. The guy got up. The guy was healed. Why in the Sam Hill would he say, grab your mat? Take your mat. Because, like I just said, this was who he was. To understand, you got to go back to verse number six. When Jesus asked him this, do you want to be healed? Verse number seven, he says, sure I do, but every time the angel comes and troubles the water, I have no one to get me in the pool. And the guy had a legitimate excuse. He goes, I, I'm here. I show up every day. Because from what I understand, they couldn't spend overnight, you know, so they had to, they had to get out. Clear, you know, clear the air. But every day he'd get back there. Somehow he'd get back there. We don't know if he got someone drug him there. I, I, remember, I remember in Haiti when I was there, Nick, uh, you, you would see uh, 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 young kids uh, or teenagers on, on the streets with their legs, where their legs were completely folded up underneath them. They were deformed and folded up and they would sit there and beg. These kids couldn't walk. They walked on their hands is how they got around. And, and every day I asked the missionary, I said, how, how do the, first of all, why are so many kids, is there a birth defect? Is what, what? He goes, no, if they, after so many kids in the family, what the parents do is they take the children's legs and they tie them with a belt or a rope up underneath them to deform the children. And after they've left the legs there long enough, the legs are deformed. They'll never walk on them again. And then they take the kids out to the street and they sit them there for all day to beg. And that's where, and then at night they come and they pick the kids up and they bring them home. So this guy was like, I, I want to get in the water, but I can't. I'm physically unable. And that's what I love about Jesus Christ. We are physically unable to cure our sin disease. We are physically unable. But he isn't. He isn't. He is able. I serve a God who's able. Who's able to forgive me of my sin. Who's able to restore my faith. Who's able to bring sight to the blind. And hearing to the deaf. And walk to the lame. So in verse number seven, he gives it a good excuse. But just imagine you being that dude, uh, the 38 years who hasn't been able to walk. Imagine the look on his face when Jesus Christ said to him, get up. Can you imagine the look on your face? 
When I, if I would walk up to you and you're crippled and I would walk up to you and say, just get up. I can imagine the look on your face. I can imagine the look on my face like, yeah. It would be that sarcastic like, yeah, sure. But for some reason, this guy, I don't think he had that look. Because as soon as Jesus Christ said to him, get up, he didn't doubt. It says that he stood up and he was healed. No hesitation. No, I'll do it tomorrow. No, I'm just going to keep sticking with my excuse. I've tried to get in the pool, but I can't. Because from what I've studied, this guy, this 38-year-old whatever disabled person, we don't know that he knew who Christ was. Jesus wasn't wearing a name tag. Jesus, son of God, savior of the world, baby in the manger. People are going to write songs about me. They're going to make a movie about me. There's no buttons. There's no identification on him. But yet, he stood up. Now pick up your mat and walk. Now here, a crowd for sure. All right, first of all, there was already a crowd there. Because there was a lot of people in the same condition as this man. And they would go there. And there were, I'm sure, I, I got to be honest, if I'm on my way to work, and I'm walking past the pool of Bethesda, I'm going to stop. I'm going to take a gander to see what's happening. Okay, here's the water. It's stirred. Who's going to get in today? I'm sure there were wagers. No, I, I bet you there was. There were, I bet you there was bets. People were making away. I bet you that dude, tended area, that he's going to get in the pool before that one. It'd be like a horse race. Because that kind of stuff, there was gambling that went on. So I'm sure, I'm sure there was this gambling. I'm sure there was all kinds. So there was a lot of people at this spot. So people were watching. But people were watching both in the physical, but heaven was watching in the spiritual. Hebrews 12, verse number one says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. We are therefore surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And I'm not talking a cloud that all our pictures go to. I'm talking in a spiritual sense that there is a cloud there is a cloud of witnesses watching our entire life in a spiritual sense. There is also a cloud of witnesses that is watching us in our physical sense. There are people constantly watching, 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 watching. And they want to see. So it's twofold, the heavenly witnesses and the earthly. Here's a question. How will people here on earth know about Christ unless they are told? That's a question. The, so you don't, if you don't know, the Firehouse Chapel has been established on that one premise. To tell as many people about Jesus Christ as humanly possible. Next month we will be 17 years old. In fact, it will be a Sunday, September 22nd. The Firehouse Chapel will be 17 years old. And the core reason of why we're here is to tell people about Jesus Christ and to instruct you, to teach you, to train you, to equip you to tell people about Jesus Christ. Now, for some people, they get confused by that, but that's what it's about. So that parents, you can teach your kids. You can train your kids up in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. And we're to teach you so you can talk to your neighbor, to your friend, to your coworker, to your loved one, to people you don't even like. Maybe someone standing in Sam's Club behind you. Maybe someone standing in Waltz. Whatever. But see, right here, here's a question. How will people here on earth know about Christ unless they're told? How will people see for themselves what a new life in Christ looks like unless someone shows them? People watch you. How many of you watch people? We all do. We all do. I'm not a big downtown. You guys know this. I'm not a big downtown person. I just don't like it. Just, there's no grass. 
there's no, there's no grass. There's no, you, you, there's no grass. I got called for jury duty one time, two weeks, daily center. Two weeks. I got picked. They made me the form two weeks in the summer. Lunch, they take an hour and a half lunch. Who takes an hour and a half lunch? Who, to have, I'm like dozing off by that time. An hour and a half, that's insane. So I'd go down to the, what is it, the Daily Plaza thing? Just to watch stuff. There was a McDonald's around the corner. I'd get food and I'd go take my shirt off and sit there and, and I would just eat and I would just watch everybody walk by. But after like the third or fourth day, I'm realizing, because you know, if you sit in, I'm, again, I don't know what, but the sun comes, the buildings, they block everything. The sun comes and so I'm sitting, catch some rays, you know, I'm just like eating my food and, and I notice I'm watching people. Well, people are walking by noticing me. I'm like, why are you staring at me? Like, what's wrong? And I happened to mention it to somebody, I don't know, I don't think it was you, Chira, but someone, I told them what I'm doing, and like, they're like, wait, you take your shirt off? Yeah. First of all, I'm going to sweat. I don't want to sweat in my shirt. So I take my shirt off, and I just sit there and eat my food. You do that in daily center? Yeah. Why, is there something wrong with that? Do people stare at you when you, they walk by? I'm like, yeah. Like, what's that about? Then they said, the next day that I go, look to see if anybody else has their shirt off. And you know what I found out? Nobody did. It didn't stop me from taking mine off, but I just sat there like, huh. Oh. I found out it's frowned upon. It's not upper crust or whatever it is. You don't take your shirt off sitting in the sun. It's just terrible. Terrible. People watch. And people would rather see than hear. Oh. When I poured concrete, this one cement truck driver was using the F word. I mean, every, couldn't, couldn't, I, couldn't put two words together without the F word being in there. I'm like, do you realize, all the crew knew I was, you know, know who I was, a Christian, and, and they're all laughing because, you know, they were waiting. They were, couldn't wait to tell the guy I was a pastor. Just couldn't, just waiting for, for the guy to sink himself enough in a hole for me. Then, so anyway, I, I'm thinking while well, the guy's saying about this and that and this other stuff, and I'm thinking, man, if he would just do away with the F word, maybe use it once every 10 words. His whole conversation would be over like in five seconds. But you're waiting because he keeps throwing that, uh, you know, it's just constant. Blah, 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 blah. So finally, one of the guys said, uh, said something and they, they called me Pastor Steve. And this guy, you know, he's, we're down the hole. He's up there and we're at the chute and he stopped, he literally stopped the chute, the concrete, and he, and he's listening. And now they're getting louder. Hey, Pastor Steve, would you... And the guy's looking, and the boss, Merrill, looks at him and goes, he's a pastor. Well, the guy just all of a sudden told me what church he goes to, <laughs> what choir he sings in, and all this stuff. Now, I ain't perfect. And I know people watch me. But words and actions, give me actions. Jesus Christ just didn't say, I will die on the cross. Jesus Christ did die on the cross. God just didn't say, I will resurrect him from the dead. God did resurrect him from the dead. Jesus just didn't say, I will come back. He is coming back. There's action there. And what this was showing people, when he took up his mat, people will see that. I feel the reason Jesus said, don't forget your mat, is he wanted people. He wanted others to see what the cripple once was when he laid on the mat and what he is now as he carries his mat. Can you imagine, you see this guy, because you see him, if you're on the tri-state at a certain time every day or 3.55 a certain time of the day, you see the same cars. 
How many of you have done that? I've seen the same cars when I've been on at the same time because everybody's going at the same time. This is what time we go to work. Can you imagine them walking down the street? No, nope, there goes the cripple dude. There goes the cripple dude. He's either being carried or drugged or whatever. But there goes the cripple dude. And then later on in the day, they... Wait, is that the cripple dude? Well, it's got to be. Look, he's, he's got a mat. So, see? Mat, cripple dude. But wait, something's different. He's, he's walking. Normal. Or he's not bouncing off of walls because he's blind. Or look, he was as stiff as a board because he's paralyzed. And now look, he's doing yoga. See, the fact is that Jesus Christ wanted him so that people could see the difference. If he just, hear me, if he just would have left his mat there, people would have been confused with who he was. You ever run into somebody out of an ordinary place where you normally see them? And you're standing there trying to figure out where you see them from? I've told you it happened to me. Hugged a lady in Sam's Club one time. She saw me, I said, hey, how are you, hugger? Like, I have no idea where she's from. I thought she was from church. No, she was from the post office. You're, you're trying to like, where do I know them from? Yeah, postal workers need hugs. But see, now he's like, people are like, wait. You know why? Because the, 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 the crippleness, the lameness, the paralyzedness defined who he was. He was a cripple. But now he's carrying his mat. There's a lot more. But we'll stop there. This is what's amazing to me. Listen. Jesus wants to change your life. Jesus can change your life. But you got to... You got to an answer. You got to an answer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for your truth that you bring to us through your word. I thank you, Lord, how it can change us and mold us and shape us. I thank you, Father, that it is there. Now, Lord, I pray that people have heard the knock on the door of their heart. They've gotten up to answer it. You've come in, and now, Lord, you sit and eat with them. Jesus, be real to people today. With your heads bowed for just a moment, I'm going to ask this question as I do every week. If you want to get to the place where you want to accept Christ, you're hearing that call. It's time to leave behind that life. You keep laying on that mat, you're just going to rot there. But you want that new life in Christ. I want to pray for you. How we do it? I'll ask you to look at me in just a moment. Once we see, make eye contact, then you can close your eyes and I'll pray for you. My right, you want to pray that? Look at me right now. You want to give Christ the first thing in your life. Sure. Any more? My left. Okay, got it. Pray this from your heart. Jesus, I hear you knocking. I'm opening the door to my heart. Come on in. Sit with me. Because I want to sit with you. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, of my sin. Give me a brand new life. Help me in my weaknesses. Strengthen me, Lord. Equip me. And then, Lord, use me according to your plan. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you all stand?